Uh, it took me only a couple of minutes on the internet to find papal remarks about poverty in the church. For example, in the concrete history of the church, a contrary tendency is also manifested, namely that the church becomes self-satisfied, settles down in this world, becomes self-sufficient, and adapts herself to the standards of the world. And again, not infrequently, the church gives greater weight to organization and institutionalization than to her vocation of openness towards God and her vocation of opening up the world towards itself and the other. And finally, once liberated from material and political burdens and privileges, the church can reach out more effectively and in a more truly Christian way to the whole world than she can be truly open to the world. Lovely words from our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI. When Michael uh, asked me to make these remarks, I responded that I am not a theologian but a historian, and the best I could probably do was to register some impressions of the medieval church, often, which is often portrayed as rich and therefore corrupt, of course, uh, as a model not only of social service with its num numerous free hospitals, leprosaria, and its protection of widows and orphans. I commented that the medieval canonists also drew directly on patristic sermons, like that one quoted by his eminence, uh, in which they, from which they created what modern law knows as the necessity doctrine, by which when the poor steal food from the rich in times of famine, they commit no crime, because as the medieval and modern axiom goes, in times of necessity, all things are common. Since the 1970s, English and American courts have attempted to radically restrict this ancient principle of equity, uh, but it remains va valid, if ever less so in Anglo-American law, certainly in moral theology. But that's another story. On reflection, I realize that being for the poor needs a human face as much as it needs reflection by prof a professional theologian or canonist. Indeed, the very the title of this convocation reflects the concerns of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who, as we have already heard, has spoken of the need for us to become ever more a poor church for the poor. His very choice of the name Francis reminds us that the Pope wants a church that goes to the margins and is for the poor, as it was exemplified in the little poor man of Assisi. Not surprisingly, the name of Francis and the saint's mythology seem, for many, the optic through which a servant church is to be understood. And I, I will say of that, all the better, if we concentrate not on the myth, but on the man. We are fortunate to live in an age when, at least in academic circles, we are recovering under often trivial and sentimental rhetoric what Francis thought he was about. Forgive me a short bibliographical digression. Since the word of my good friend David Burr at Virginia Tech on the spiritual Franciscans, which showed that much of the legalistic and rigorous understanding of poverty typical of the radicals was a creation of the late 13th century, uh, some 50 years after the saint's death. Like the spirituals, some modern authors have happily read such ideas about poverty back into Francis himself. In addition to David, Andre Vaucher's magisterial study of the Francis of history and the Francis of memory has alerted us to such ideological remakings of the little poor man. That is a project of retrieval to which I've made my own small contribution. My first encounter of the problem of the remaking of Francis <clears throat> as the mouthpiece of ideology came while working on the stories found in what is known as the Assisi compilation a collection whose nucleus dates probably to the late 1250s, a period when reworking the memories was well underway. In a famous story, a novice comes to Francis <clears throat> and asks to have a Psalter, a book of Psalms. Francis says no, condemning this as a violation of poverty. The novice then comes back the next day asking again for a Psalter. Francis, in more forceful language, again forbids it. The third day, the novice is back yet again, and Francis sends him off with the instruction, go talk to my vicar. The vicar gives the novice permission to have a psalter, and when Francis sees him with the psalter, the saint goes crazy. He throws himself down on the ground, sprinkles dust on his head, cries out, woe is we, woe is me, now you have a psalter. Soon you'll have a breviary. Then you'll sit in a high chair, and you'll say to the brothers, bring me my breviary. <laughs> <laughs> 
Alas, alas, God forgive me. I discarded this story, put it on the worthless testimony pile. Why? Francis had his own personal bravery with the Sunday Gospels bound into it, and you can see it today in Assisi in the Basilica of Santa Chiara. I was right to at least discard it in that form, but I later found the same incident in Francis's own words in his rule of 1221, the one that didn't become the official rule. Here, however, the sin of the novice was wanting to learn to read. After all, what else do medieval people do with Psalters? He would then, as a literate cleric, need a bravery to say his office. And then he would get ordained a priest and boss around the unordained lay brothers saying, bring me my bravery. Francis commanded that the illiterate brothers be satisfied with reciting our fathers. They were not to engage in status climbing and advancement. They were to be fratres minores, lesser brothers, not fratres pauperes, poor brothers, a title which the saint explicitly rejected for his movement. Franciscan poverty then is more about being below others, being lowest and subject, even marginal, than it is about having stuff. And I think this will be clearer as we continue. A church for the poor. Let us start with Francis himself, his own writings. It may come as a surprise that there is no authentic writing by Francis that uses the words lady poverty. The phrase originates in a poetic work written within a decade of his death. In his own writings, Francis uses, Francis uses the word pauper and its derivatives only six times. And those who know the wonderful new translation of his works, uh, Francis' early documents, know that his own works in that are over 150 pages. One of these six times is in the formula, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And one uh, and four of them are in quotations from the Psalms. What should the, we make of this silence? Francis's poverty is not a concept, an ideal type, or a, or a hypostatization of some ideology. What can we learn? Perhaps most strikingly, the famous incident in which Francis went before his bishop, renounced his inheritance rights, and having stripped himself of his clothing and giving it to his father, is never mentioned by Francis in any of his own writings, nor does he allude to it. Rather, let's let him speak for himself using his own words about his conversion, as he recounted it in his testament just before his death. The Lord granted me, Brother Francis, to begin doing penance in this way. When I was in my sins, just to see lepers was very bitter for me. And the Lord himself took me among them, and God showed mercy to me through them. And on leaving them, what seemed bitter to me had turned into sweetness of body and soul. And afterward, I waited little before I left the world. Certainly, this was an encounter of the poor of the poor. To use modern categories, the marginalized, excluded, and despised. To encounter poverty, then, was for Francis not about giving up something, especially not about giving up legal titles to real estate or something like that, but about finding sweetness in the refuse of society. For Francis, poverty is not something of ideas, but something about persons. Persons to whom the saint made himself subject, their slave and servant. In this experience, Francis tells us that his perception of reality was changed. What was bitter was now sweet, and perhaps what was sweet is now bitter. And God had performed this change by the agency of the most unlikely. God showed me mercy through them, the lepers. To understand what was going on theologically for Francis in the leper incident, we need to turn to one of his eight extant letters composed a decade later, the later admonition and exhortation to the brothers of penance. This letter was written for lay penitents, of which Francis had been one, and is still read as the rule of Dominican tertiaries to this day. Francis opens his exhortation with a long section on how the word of the Father exalted above all creation, humbled himself to take flesh from the virgin, 
an act that was, and here is one of the two places he uses the word, to choose poverty. This is the only mention of poverty in Francis's letters, of which there are eight. Indeed, it is the only extended commentary on poverty in all his writings. And this poverty is not linked to giving up property, simplicity of life, or living only for the day. It isn't even about serving lepers. Francis identifies this poverty with the very physicality of the human condition taken on by the word of God. Nor does Francis focus on that poverty in itself. Rather, he passes to how the word made flesh gave himself to his followers on the night before his passion, when he took bread and wine and by the words, this is my body and this is my blood, gave his physical body to his disciples as food. Jesus' act of self-giving is again, without elaboration, linked to the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross. The chalice of his blood given to the disciples is the same one that Jesus spoke of in his prayer to the Father. Father, let this chalice pass from me as his sweat became as drops of blood flowing down upon the earth. At that last supper then, Jesus instituted the Eucharist so that as victim on the altar of the cross, he could give us an example so that we might follow in his footsteps. This highlights a theme that is constant in Francis's post-conversion life. The imitation of Christ is an self, act of self-offering which becomes real and tangible, quote, in all the churches of the world, above all in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Christ at the Last Supper commanded his disciples to do as he did, to speak his words over the bread and so in eating it receive his true body, to take into oneself the living and crucified body, to venerate it at the elevation, and to do so worthily, so as to share in the true poverty embraced by the word, human flesh, torn and suffering, bleeding and dying for others. It horrified Francis that some were indifferent or hostile to Christ's command. He wrote, those who do not want to taste how good the Lord is in communion, and who love the shadows more than light, not wanting to fulfill the mandate of God, have been cursed. It is they whom, of whom the prophet wrote, cursed are they who turn away from your mandates. I know of no other place where Francis describes others as cursed. After pointing the way to self-emptying, that is the sacrament, Francis reintroduces the great commandment of Christ to love God above all things and one's neighbor as oneself, explaining that the love of God is identical with that poured out in prayers of adoration before God by night and day through which believers become adorers in spirit and in truth. A poor church. Francis' second major revision of his earlier exhortation comes after this meditation on Christ's work and the sacrament. Francis had previously linked penance almost entirely to fasting and corporal mortification of the body, making it almost an end in itself. And indeed, for the later Franciscans, poverty was almost always linked to individual and corporate acts of self-denial, giving up things. Now in his more developed teaching, Francis links penance, now explicitly understood within the context of the sacrament as confession to a priest, directly in preparation for reception of communion. Beyond sacramental confession, Francis focuses on three specific acts of penance. Those who are in positions of power who can impose their will on others or to withhold their authority and exercise mercy rather than judgment. Those with possessions are to give them up by almsgiving. And finally, all believers, even those without power or property, can abstain from their vices and sins and practice fasting and prayer. He wrote, we must be Catholics. We must visit churches frequently and venerate clerics and revere them not so much for their own sake, for they may be sinners, but account, on account of their office and administration of the most holy body and blood of Christ, which they sacrifice on the altar and receive and minister to others. The logic, or I guess I would better say the poetic associations in Francis's thought have taken us full circle. The subordination of the Christian to the church not only makes sense because Christ has chosen to use its clergy, sinners as they are, to make his own self-emptying present to the world through the Mass, to participate worthily in this is for Francis what it means to love God above all things. So, the poverty experienced in the marginalized lepers 
he now understood as receiving its power from the self-emptying of the great outcast, who is son of God and savior of the world. And one cannot be poor without the union that comes from properly prepared reception of the sacramental Christ. Perhaps this goes a long way to explain why Pope Francis in his daily talks seemed to, to harp incessantly on going to confession and on the obligation to priests to hear confession, challenges mainly ignored by the mainline media. A poor church, while certainly shunning ostentation and ease, is one that recognizes its abject poverty in the sinfulness of its members and its ministers. In no other way can it give proper reference to the body of the Lord really present in the Eucharist and in the poorest of the poor. So then, Francis's poverty is Christological and sacramental as well as about persons. Again, note that it is not about rules on owning wealth or abstract ideas, although it will certainly have implications for those. Spiritual and institutional poverty, and this will be my closing. Finally, we need to consider what Francis can teach us about the usual understanding of religious poverty, that is, giving up stuff. For it is certain that Francis and his followers gave away their possessions and lived in a miserable, abject state, one inconceivable for most modern religious. And it does, in fact, seem, by the time of Francis's death, that he'd been concerned, become concerned about how the friars were living their life. In his testament, to which I've, or from which I've already quoted, after some nostalgic reminiscences of the early days of his movement, Francis issues a series of peremptory orders that provide an insight into the changes and institutional developments that were tormenting Francis, along with his own grave illness. He imposed two commands on the brothers, and here is the second and last time he uses the word poverty, other than in passing in his own writings. Let all the friars beware of themselves, so that they receive almost none of the churches, the tiny poor dwellings, and all the buildings which are constructed on their behalf, unless they be uh, such as befits holy poverty. And I clearly, com I firmly command that all friars by obedience, wherever they are, do not dare to ask any letter, letter from the Roman Curia by means of themselves or by an interposed person. Francis's tone here suggests that his words were provoked by some actual events, not by abstract speculation. Other evidence confirms this. Since about 1221, witnesses reported Francis's anger at the brothers' appropriation of buildings in Bologna and Assisi. It was by a sleight of hand that Cardinal Ugolino and the commune of Assisi had circumvented Francis's reaction by claiming uh, to retain ownership for themselves and merely let the brothers use the buildings. Francis recognized that the friars would be offered other houses to live in, and he does not condemn that. There is no evidence that the places of the brothers in Assisi or Bologna were extravagant or violations of poverty. Francis didn't suggest otherwise. Rather, he focused on how admiring donors could subvert simplicity by their generosity and the brothers could collude in the sham. And he needed to warn the brothers about that. In short, even with general spiritual poverty, appearances matter. One thinks of the media acclaim that accompanied Pope Francis' choice to live in Casa Santa Maria instead of the Vatican apartment. But more pressing and dangerous to Francis' mind, as his use of the phrase, I command under obedience, reveals, was the brothers' habit of invoking papal protection and ecclesiastical privileges. This abuse was real and the pa past year had seen the papacy grant six requests for protection for Franciscans themselves, their supporters, and their missions. These privileges placed the lesser brothers in positions of privilege over others. No longer would they be subject to all. Paradoxically, this development forced Francis to place himself in the position he most disliked, that of a superior, a superior giving orders to others. Here was the same status climbing, these fires were exhibiting the same status climbing and self-promotion that Francis had condemned in the lay brother who wanted to learn to read. Francis's tone implied that it was already a lost cause and his pain is palpable. He would rather be chastised by the Pope than protected by him against criticism or adversaries. I'd like to return to the novice in his bravery. What is the nature of the lesser brother, the one subject to all? This is a condition of dependence. The physically poor, the real poor if you want, lack 
uh, depend on others for food, clothing, and shelter. They lack autonomy and independent agency. Like the illiterate novice, they are not in charge. Why would you want to imitate that? Why give away everything and live day to day as Francis and his original followers did? Because the Savior laid aside all his power, did the Father's will rather than his own, and went to the cross, not opening his mouth. To be obedient to Christ, to the saints, to the Pope and hierarchy, to priests, to all Christians, especially the poorest of the poor, that is Franciscan poverty. Like the physically poor, Francis wanted to live dependent on God, not his own resources. Having no resource of his own was the royal road to dependence on God. But above all, the road was a denial of self-will. The Savior exhibited perfect poverty when he said in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. And by those words, he gave up everything, becoming the slave of all. So I suggest that when Pope Francis asks for a poor church, this is less about real estate, although it certainly has to do with that, and more about a church that sacrifices respectability, power, and self-sufficiency. Only by that self-denial can she become a poor church, and thus a church for the poor.